memory, composer can figure out where all the modules are. Uh, so if you run, uh, you know, we ran composer required Drupal slash path auto earlier. The reason it could find Drupal slash path auto was because of this repository. If you don't, if you don't include that, it won't be able to find it because it's probably not on the main packages repository. It'll just tell you that it can't find a package called Drupal slash path auto. Uh, there are a few more packages. Uh, they're not relevant right now. And there is a require section. And this is actually a requirements. And we are saying there are, there are a uh, bunch of uh, requirements that, that are necessary to make the composer setup work. But uh, you can look at the last few lines, and that's where we actually mention our modules. Uh, like config installer, that's a profile, by the way. Uh, migrate plus, migrate tools, migrate upgrade. So I, I took the beginning of the composer file, actually. Later on, you can see things like bootstrap and uh, rules and uh, panels and so on. But, but this is how it looks. Uh, there, is, there is very little apart from this in the composer file. Most of the composer file is just to get the Drupal setup working. And uh, all of this is included in the template, so you don't have to worry. Before we move on, any questions so far? Yeah, please. Uh, I think you should take the mic. I have an existing... Uh, D8 installation, how do I get this to work on my existing one? I don't have a web directory, and some of my um, my directories are being tracked. Okay. Like you had the um, contrib is ignored, mine, so is, mine your... is being tracked. How do I set up my installation to this? Okay. Is your existing website uh, already using Composer? Okay, okay, it's not. Uh, so there is... Uh, this, this little point in this exercise, I think if you're going to uh, use certain modules, then you must invest time to just translate it over like this. It's, uh, most of the things won't change because the code is still the same. It's just the way you're getting your code. That's the only difference over here. So you can transparently start placing your composer JSON files. Uh, you probably can't use the shortcuts we discussed earlier, like, not like composer create project and all that. Or you can do that and then copy just the composer files in your project's directory. Uh, and if you have a web directory on your, in your project, you're good to go. You know. uh, otherwise, you need to make further customizations to your project. There is no easy way to transition from a custom setup what you have to this. It, it is possible. It might need some effort. Any other questions? Yeah, yeah please. Uh, with this process, uh, working with Composer, uh, uh, is it possible also to do the updates for core and also updates yes. for the models? Yeah. Actually, that's the very next topic I'm going to talk about. Uh, when, when I talk about version constraints, we'll see how updates become possible. Okay, I think let's move on. Yeah, okay, please. Also, when you have the opportunity, uh, because this is kind of a tweaky sort of format, linting tools would probably be a great thing to do just to make sure that uh, you're not breaking your composer.json or some other files like that, especially since you can't really comment them. Well, uh, there is a handy command called composer validate. You just run that command and it will lint the uh, file for you. So uh, whenever you make a change, uh, you, can, you always run it through Composer Validate, which will check if the format is correct. And uh, anyway, you know, if you're testing a change to Composer or JSON, you're probably going to uh, run a Composer update or install anyway, uh, which will tell you if something is broken. Okay. Yeah. So how do we maintain the custom modules and the dependencies for the custom modules? Uh, yeah, that, that's an interesting thing. Uh, I, I would suggest in simpler cases, uh, you would just put the custom modules in the repository. Now, there is another thing about the autoloader over here, which is more of a development-related topic. Uh, we'll actually see an example later on where uh, how do you include uh, the dependencies of your custom module as well. We'll see an example later on. Uh, this is more of a developer topic. Uh, but, but yeah, that, that's an interesting question. Uh, as far as the custom modules themselves are concerned, 
I would say for simpler sites, just put them in the same repository. That's still your code, right? That's still the application you're writing. So, of course, go and put it in the repository. Uh, if, if you want to make it more reusable across different websites, you can actually put it on a private uh, packages. There are a lot of options over there. All those are actually kind of advanced uh, composer things. I'm happy to discuss that, but it's not really in the flow of the presentation. Okay, so moving on, let's talk about semantic versioning and versioning constraints. Like uh, you brought up the point of how do we uh, take care of updates. Uh, so semantic versioning was is actually been brought up by in almost every keynote since Drupal 8 is being worked upon, and it uh, basically defines a convention of how the version numbers are supposed to look like. So. You might, uh, you might be uh, familiar with the Drupal 7's version numbers. You know, we had from 7.1 until 7.54 now, you know. And all we are doing in most cases is just adding uh, bug fixes. We're just fixing bugs. We're not adding features or at least not major features. We added some features in 7.50, but th that was like very small. But we wanted to change that, uh, we, the whole thing with our Drupal 8's release cycle, right? And uh, you might be aware that with Every six months, we are releasing a new minor uh, minor release. So we had 8.1, 8.2, we just had 8.3, and in six months, we'll have 8.4. And uh, we are adding features over there. And in each of these cycles, we are having various patch releases. So we had 8.2.8 .8 recently, and 8.3.1. Uh, and those are bug fixes. You can't add features in there. And when we come to Drupal 9, like we saw today morning, you know, the Drupal 8 modules won't readily work with that. That's a breaking change. A module written for Drupal 8.2 will work with, with 8.3, but not with 9.0. Not necessarily with 9.0. It might work, you know, like we saw if, if it's staying up to date with API changes. And that, in a sense, is semantic versioning. It just defines in a more technical way that this is how you should name your number your versions. If you're adding a feature, make it the next minor release, 8.4. If you're breaking something uh, in backward compatibility, make it a new major release, Drupal 9. That's all it says. So how does this help us? When we're talking about updates, right, uh, you might want to just uh, stay on, let's say, 8.2 line. You, you're, of course, you want the uh, patch updates. You know, there was a security release a couple of weeks, or just last week. Uh, and you want to make sure that you update to that release with minimal effort. Uh, or you might even want that you're happy with updating to the next minor release. You know, when 8.3 came out, you're happy to go to 8.3. With Drush Make, we specified the exact version we wanted earlier. In Composer, we can use something like this. Uh, these kind of version constraints, which... Uh, which, which make it easier for you to specify that these are the versions to be used. So you see in the first line over here, Drupal slash core 8.3 point star, it just says that I'm happy with any 8.3 release, starting from 8.3.0, 8.3.1, and so on. Uh, or you can use a special syntax like you see in the next one, Drupal slash color box, and that's a tilde, tilde 1.0. That basically says I, I'm happy with 1.0, 1.1, 1 1.2, uh, but not 2.0. Until 2.0 comes, I'm happy with all 1.x releases. It's just a fancier way of uh, writing that. And uh, this, uh, okay, let's, let's just talk about a few more uh, different kind of version numbers. Uh, we also can write, suppose you want a dev release for some, uh, some reason. So you can use a syntax like that, 1.x dash dev, or... Uh, you know, you want to specify like 8.2.8 .8 came out recently, right? You want to say, I want at least 8.2.8, .8, but anything in 8.3 and onwards is also fine. So you would use a syntax like that. Uh, these are a little exotic, you know, you'd probably never use them. The most common is the one we saw, like the star one or the, and the tilde one. That, that's the one you would see most. But you can actually get even more control. You can exactly specify these are the versions you want or in this range, like you can say greater than, equal to 1.0, but less than 1.5, or something like that. By the way, uh, this the second example is identical to the, the, the previous slide. Now, 
how do you use this? So when you have this composer.json file and when you run composer install, it actually matches this version constraints with all the possible versions and installs the latest version it can, depending on the constraints. So in case of if we're, if we're uh, using Drupal slash co with this constraint, it will install 8.3.1 in this case. If suppose uh, for some reason you want to stay with path auto 1.4, you don't want to go to 1.5, you would use a constraint like that for whatever reason, you know, uh, until you're ready to move on, you use this constraint. And you run composer install, it always picks up the latest file. There is also something called composer lock, which is a caveat to my previous, uh, previous point, that when you run composer install for the first time, it generates a lock file. And lock file, you'd probably never edit this. That's the reason I don't have a screenshot over here. There's no reason you need to look at it. Composer handles it entirely by itself. This lock file contains the exact version of the dependencies you have installed. So at the time of development, if you have installed, let's say 8.2.8, .8, your version constraints allow anything to be installed, even 8.3, 8.4, and so on. And they are released. But if your lock file specifies 8.2.8, .8, it will always install 8.2.8. .8. And this is, the, this, this is because you want your application to, uh, you have tested your application with a particular version, right? And of course, you know, everything is supposed to work in an ideal world, right? But we're not living in an ideal world. Uh, we, we are confident with what we have tested and we want to stick with that until we are ready to run with updates. And that is why we have a command. When we run composer update, it will ignore the log file. It will look at the version rules all over again and uh, update whatever versions it can. So. In the log file, you may be using 8.2.8, .8, but if there is 8.3.0, you'll update to that. Does that answer your question with this? You would run Compose Update whenever you're ready for updates. Uh, a thumb rule over here is that if you're building an application, as in you're building a website, you always commit the composer.log file as well. Because the next developer that picks up, the developer would run Composer install and get the identical environment running. If you don't com uh, commit the log file, it'll always, it's, it's open-ended. You know, your version constraints can allow and should allow uh, a range of possible versions, uh, you know, as per the rules of semantic versioning and all that. Uh, and also, Composer install is faster. Uh, Composer update, uh, if, you, if you've used Composer by now, you know, you would have noticed Composer, the first Composer install or Composer update are, are quite slow. That's because it, it actually checks the range of versions that are possible and everything. Uh, but Composer install, it, it's fast. Uh, so this is the simple usage of Composer so far. Um, now, now more specific usages in uh, terms of patches. You know, somebody asked a question re related to patches. How do we use, uh, no, sorry, that was different. Uh, so how do we patch? In Drush Make, there is way, in, uh, you know, how, how we specify patches for a certain module. We can do that in Composer or JSON as well. And uh, this is roughly how it looks. Uh, there is a section in composer.json, um, and you just have to follow the format. There are examples for this, and uh, I'll, I'll share the slides so you can always take a look, with, uh, to take a look at that. Uh, the important thing is that you include a package called uh, C, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not sure how to pronounce that, slash composer patches. And uh, that makes it possible for all the patches to work. And you, you probably don't need to include it because the composer template I mentioned earlier, it, it has it by default. Uh, so it, it works very similar to how the patches work in make files. Over here in the patches entry, you specify each package and then you specify the, like a label for the patch and the name of uh, the link to the file. Uh, you can't see that over here. It's chopped off in the screenshot. Uh, but, but the link where the patch is stored. And yeah, you can use local parts. And uh, there was a question related to custom composer or JSON. Um, so this is how you would use, it's, uh, there is a, a component called merge plugin, which uh, lets you, like it says, you know, it merges a different composer or JSON into the existing one. Um, I, I think Drupal's core uses it, but I couldn't find the example. But if you, have a, if you have a custom module which has dependencies, like for example, this uh, 
module I wrote called Contrib Tracker, it needs a, a third party dependency, which is on packagist. So I include the I include the composer of JSON expl, uh, explicitly. It's the whole path to composer JSON, and it will resolve all the dependencies in the composer in the custom module as well. So uh, this is again important because Compose is also an autoloader, and that, that's, uh, I think I'll, I'll digress if I go too deep into that. Um, it basically means that the classes, which uh, the classes, the code in the, in the third party components referred to by this composer or JSON, it won't be available in the code flow unless you do this. So, uh, again, this is something that developers have to worry about. So uh, if you're a developer, uh, you probably know what autoloading means. If not, I'm happy to talk about it uh, outside the session. Again, like I said, this is uh, this this is not uh, built into Composer. It's it's uh, available through a plugin called uh, Wikimedia slash Composer Merge plugin, and uh, this is again present in the Composer template. That's actually a cool thing of uh, in the whole package is you know opening up to the different things. This plugin. We use it for Drupal, but it was actually not written by Drupal community at all. It was written by the Wikimedia community, and we are benefiting from it. This is the cool thing. This is the reason we want to get uh, everyone on the the whole PHP, uh, you know, like the larger ecosystem bandwagon, because we are now sharing a lot more code, and we are much more standardized across the whole spectrum. Um, this is a UI tool I've come across recently, and uh, this is actually the only UI tool I have found that lets you manage composer JSON. And uh, I, I, in, personally, I think uh, it needs a lot of work. But for any reason, if you are not comfortable with terminal, I think you can start lo by looking at this. Uh, that's the link where it's available. It's a it's available as a Windows and a OS X application. I think Linux as well. And uh, you get an interface like that. When you open up your project, you get an interface like that. It just lists all the requirements you have, and you can you have buttons to install, update, or validate the composer JSON file. There is uh, there is very little it does which you can't do in terminal, and you probably be more comfortable in the terminal anyway. Uh, like I said, this UI needs more work. And uh, if you have any suggestions for the UI, or for a different UI, or for a different way to manage composer or JSON. I, I want to I want to hear about it. Okay, so that's actually the end of the bulk of the presentation. Any any questions? Please. Uh, is there a, for instance, if the database was updated on the model? Uh, well, there, there's two questions. If the database was updated in the model. Do you have to run the update of the database with Composer? That's the, the question number one. And the question number two is, for instance, if you grab a model and then uh, put it on Drupal.org, how it gets sent to the packages? I'm sorry, what is the second question? The second one is, uh, if you grab a model and then put it on, on Drupal.org, okay. how do you uh, share it with uh, packages? Okay, so I'll, I'll, I'll answer the second one first It's uh, because it's quicker. Um, it doesn't get sent to the main packages.org. Uh, there is a service running on Drupal.org itself. The link I shared earlier, packages.drupal.org slash uh, eight. If you go there, you'll not, you'll probably not see anything. It's just a JSON output. Uh, that's where it gets updated, and that is why you need to put the repository in your composer JSON file. So all the Drupal modules are available through that packages, not the main packages. Does that answer your question? So, so for instance. Um is is a uh, automatic process that syncs. Yes. yes. Ah, okay. So yeah. whenever you uh, so if you are a module contributor, I mean you're contributing a module and you create a, a, uh, you create a full module, it's immediately reflected into the mm. packages .drupal. and it is intelligent enough to take uh, what kind of module it is uh, because the modules, the themes, the profiles are handled slightly differently. Uh, so it it actually takes care. So if you're creating a module, it will go into the modules directly. It does that job, and uh, I'm sorry. What was the first question? I the first one is uh, if the model, for instance, updated the uh, the database, 
uh, and you download or update the model with the composer, uh -huh. but you still okay. have to run those updates in the database. Yeah, the, you, Where saying, do you run that? Okay, you, you mean brush update DB? Yeah, something y like that, yes. Yeah. Uh, right now, composer does not do that. There is actually some effort in figuring out how best do we do that, because uh, composer, like, it's a, like I said earlier, it, it's a more of a PHP thing, and there is no concept of enabled or disabled modules there in Composer. Drupal has that concept. So uh, I should have mentioned earlier, you know, when you run Composer require, it does not enable the module, at least as of yet. It just downloads the module. You still have to run rush en to enable the module. So we are not entirely replacing rush or Drupal console. We are just uh, replacing the rush DL part of it. And like I said, the reason is that you better handle your dependencies. But we are working for that. You know, uh, this is definitely a concern we have, and we are we are trying to figure out ways. You know, how we can make all of this more seamless. So, any suggestions you have, I'm happy to hear. Hi, and thank you. Um, you had said that the composer.json is sort of comparable to Drush Make, but more flexible. Could you clear, like expand on that? Okay, um, sure. So uh, Drush Make it was written for Drupal, and it actually did a lot of things very well, like specifying patches and all that. There was one limitation in, uh, well, I would say two limitations in Drush Make that was kind of a, uh, not a deal breaker, but a big disadvantage. One of them was that you could not specify version constraints, like we saw. You always specify the, the exact version that you need. So if there are updates down the line, you know, you have to go, go to the make file, update each and every line with the latest version. So you have to actually figure out what's the latest version and then run rush make again. That was one. Second thing is more subtle. And it happens if you're going to use dev releases. So let's say you have specified a dev release as version in rush make. Now what would happen is that at the time of development, you would have run rush make and you would have got the latest dev release. But when the next developer is checking out, there could actually be an updated dev release. And when the next developer runs Drush Make, uh, he or she gets the, the updated dev release. And that might not be what is intended, right? Because the code might have broken, the site might have broken with the update. You have no way of knowing that. And uh, Composer solves both those things. It lets you specify a range of versions or you know, a more flexible version constraint. And with the log file, you can actually lock it to a particular commit. So, you know, a, a dev release in time, a particular commit hash, it locks it to that. So whenever the next developer runs, and it could, there could be 100 dev releases after that, but it'll still pick that commit. And uh, also, like I said, brush make is just a way to def uh, define your dependencies. Composer is also an autoloader. It's an autoloader. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. So I've been using Composer a little bit with Drupal already. And um, one issue I've run into is that sometimes when I update Drupal core, it changes the composer.json file, sometimes wiping out things that I had been adding to it for my site. What's the right way of handling it so that that isn't an issue, I guess? So this actually is, it's almost definitely a bug. Uh, it's not supposed to change a composer.json file. Uh, the only, if you're using uh, commands like composer require, that's the only composer require, composer remove, and so on. Those are the only commands that are supposed to touch the composer.json file. Hmm. Nothing else should. So if if something else is something is not working th this way, I think it's most definitely a bug, and you know we should probably take a closer look. Uh, but the the right way to do this, I would suggest, if you're not comfortable editing the JSON file yourself, is the composer require series of commands. So you the command we saw hmm. earlier, composer require Drupal slash path auto. That's how you would specify your dependencies. Certainly. Okay. And composer remove. So there is a, I didn't demo that command. Uh, I, th I thought it was a little out of the way. But if you want to remove a certain, uh, remove a uh, module, you would run composer remove Drupal slash path auto in that. Mm -hmm. The cool thing about that is that it will actually track that what is a dependency and what is not. So, you know, when we ran composer require path auto, it actually installed token and C tools. Now, when you run composer remove, remove path auto, it'll, it'll even remove token and C tools, unless something else is using it. You know. Thank you. 
So I'm a, I'm a long-time user composer, big fan. Thank you for having this talk. Everyone needs to be using composer. Um, <laughs> I agree. <laughs> so uh, my understanding is that uh, Drupal has its own, you know, packages.drupal yeah. because Drupal modules do not follow semantic versioning. So this private uh, package just serves as sort of a translation between Drupal module versions and yeah proper semantic versioning. Mm -hmm. So my question is, if I wanted to set up my own private uh, for my organization, you know, something, a, a custom private package just for our own personal Drupal modules, is mm -hmm. there anything special I have to do? Uh, well, there are two ways. Uh, if it's only once in a while kind of thing, you know, that only once in a while you would use a module this way, mm -hmm. push it to a repository, and in your composer.json, uh, you remember the repository section mm -hmm. I mentioned? And there yeah. were like few more. Uh, there were like four lines which were hidden over there. Mm -hmm. Actually, those were the four lines. I was calling in custom repositories. So you can actually do that. Um, but as far as like setting up that custom repository, I'm wondering if there's anything that has to be done to like translate module, you know, our own private module versions to. Or is you don't it, have to. You don't have to. There okay. are ways to uh, translate. So if you're using this method, mm -hmm. Uh, you specify the version numbers inside the repository's entry itself. Hmm. Um, <coughs> so if we follow semantic versioning internally for yeah. our modules, mm -hmm. then it shouldn't be a problem. Yeah, uh, it won't be a problem in, uh, in as far as the version constraints go. You would be uh, you would push code to your custom repository mm -hmm. following that convention, uh, but your package entry needs to be uh, needs to keep updated. Mm -hmm. uh, so the the package you have in Composer or JSON that needs to be updated. But if you it sounds like you need a more elaborate uh, thing, you know, I mean, of course, this is a lot of work and it is suitable for one off kind of uh, usage. Mm -hmm. But if you if you have, uh, you know, if you need like more flexible usage or, you know, a lot of modules, yeah. then it's better to use something like Torrent proxy or something like that. Yeah, it, that's uh, that's uh, like you have GitHub and GitHub Enterprise, mm -hmm. you know, it's something like that. Like you have packages mm -hmm. and uh, you have Torrent proxy. Uh, it's built by Jordi again. And uh, I, I think it's, it's, uh, it's not very expensive. It's probably like 10 bucks a month, something like that. Hmm. Okay. It's a good way to support Jordi as well for his work on Composer. Okay. Thank you very much. Sure. Uh, how is the multi-site use case being handled? Because my understanding is that Composer is a PHP dependency manager for yes. or app, dependency manager for applications. Mm -hmm. Multi-site is multiple applications. Sure. Uh, say, uh, say you have differing module versions and sites all in a specific site. Yeah. Uh, so again, personally, I've not tried a lot of it. What what is definitely possible is that you can specify each module to go in a different directory. So you might. For uh, for example, there's a particular module that you don't want in sites all, but only in a specific uh, site, site slash example dot com, let's say. Uh, so you can uh, there, there was a section we saw a little earlier. This over the installer parts, I didn't mention this earlier. But using this section, you can actually mention where you where exactly you want to place that. All right, uh, for the case where I want to have something in sites all as well as a specific site. Yeah, no. so that's something I'm not tried. I'm afraid I don't have an answer for you right okay. now. Okay, cool. Thank you. I got a question <coughs> about uh, the tracking the contrib modules. You're, you're not you're not tracking them. They're being ignored with get ignored. Yeah. So if I were to install a contrib module, how does Composer know? Like if if another developer pulls my branch, they'll get an error because they don't have that module installed. Uh, but uh, that's the workflow. So whenever the next developer picks up this, uh, picks up the website, the first thing the developer needs to do is run Composer install. And since you added that module, you would have added it in the Composer or JSON, right? So when the next developer runs Composer install, you would get the module from the lock file. Yeah, from the JSON file as well, because you're committing both of them. The lock file contains the version information, but the JSON file contains the entries themselves. So both have to be in sync. That's why I said, you know, log file, you probably won't ever touch it. Uh, you know, it's, it's actually for Composer's internal use. Uh, so when you commit your JSON and log file and the next developer runs Composer install, 
the composer knows okay yeah there is a new module over here install it and okay. it will install it and, and all the, the dependencies as well the best way to install it was I, I use drush to install my modules so do I use save dev so it'll write to it or how do I do that I'm sorry do I use like the save dev flag so it'll write to the to the uh, config actually part? you should not be using drush to in, uh, enable uh, sorry to download modules to enable modules yeah you will still use drush and that doesn't make a difference okay but to download modules you would now use composer require in the command line. Yeah, in the command okay. line. Okay. All right, thank you. Thank you for the session here. This is my first DrupalCon, oh. and uh, you mentioned the concept of uh, thank you, of uh, the update, Composer update, or I, I still use Drush, and uh, that's the, the day of the month where, that's why I keep my hair short, because I could be pulling out my hair on the update, the, mo the contribute modules. Uh, you, you mentioned the advantage of composers, you can exp express a range mm -hmm. uh, on the versioning. Yeah. For myself, like, wow, I would never, I'd be uh, afraid to do that because my first step whenever I uh, want to update modules, I go to Drupal.org, I go to the issue queue for that module, and, uh, you know, okay, there's a new module, I'm just checking to see are there any uh, critical or urgent or, or major or minor issues on the mm -hmm. update. Yeah, and uh, the question probably is, isn't anything you can do about, but maybe there's someone here. Boy, it would be great if there was a connection between these tools, Drush or Composer, and Drupal.org, where the community itself could uh, w respond to a there's a reg major regression right. bug in okay. the module, so that Composer would somehow be able to read this information. Like, hey, we yeah. we're not going to. That's actually a great idea. Yeah, I, I, there's nothing like that right now. But that's actually a great idea. Uh, the closest I can think of, not in Drupal, but in WordPress community, is that each plugin has uh, has a user vote system that this plugin works with the latest WordPress version, something like that. Yeah. So I, I think that's a great idea. I'm afraid we don't have anything like that. Yeah, well, I mean, as Drupal gets larger and larger and the community mm -hmm. gets larger and larger, it seems something would need to be done because yeah. otherwise each individual programmer has to go through or developer has to go through their own testing of the module and to learn now oh, there's a problem here, yeah. it's an issue queue. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, you may not want uh, uh, the whole community to have the ability to put a showstopper. Maybe there's a showstopper flag on the module, say, hey, this one, there's a new module uh, mm -hmm. upgrade here, but this, this is a breaker, a right. deal breaker. So just a few thoughts. That's, that, that's uh, actually a nice idea. The, there is something similar in the other way. Uh, there is a PHP package which lets you define security constraints. I'm sorry. <coughs> so if your if your composer JSON rules allow an insecure package to be installed, this stops it. But yeah, something like this could be a great addition. Yeah. I'll definitely look look into this. It's a great idea. Hello. Um, could you talk a little bit about deployments? Um, how this would go to staging, how this would go to production. Are you then running Composer in all of your different environments? Yes. Uh, well, the recommended answer is yes, that you would run all of them in a different environment. Uh, but personally, I, I see two ways around this. You know, if you don't have a lot of environments, sure, you know, I, I would do that. I would run Composer in the new environment and uh, test it. Uh, but if you're, if you're uh, you know, using uh, continuous deployment pra practices and so on, you'd probably use using something like Docker, or uh, you're probably hosting a, uh, using a host that does not let any such commands uh, run on the production server. So in both of these cases, uh, the way I would do this is have a separate repository, which, uh, you know, so this will be a part of your CI pipeline. Uh, you know, when you push to the, uh, push to your, uh, to your repository, it would uh, look at the code, run the comp run composer install, and uh, with with whatever is generated now, the new file system, including vendor web slash core and modules and contrib modules and everything, uh, you could probably create a Docker image out of that, and that's the image you push to production. And if you're not using a Docker, the other approach I would use is have a separate Git repository, not a clone, separate Git repository, and you push including all this vendor and web slash, this modules and everything, you push, uh, push it over there. And run your automation tests over there. So these are the two ways I would go about this. Um, quick question. It seems that what should be in .git ignore 
from the conventional D7 structure is different from what's on D8 with Composer. So when we do Composer install, does it know what should be and should not be in the dot .get ignore? Yes. Uh, so the template actually handles this. Uh, again, uh, the screenshot uh, we saw earlier, this defines uh, how, where the modules are actually placed. So this screenshot is from a Drupal 8 version, and uh, we see that for, uh, again, it's getting chopped off, but that's type Drupal hyphen module. So for Drupal module, it's going to place it in web modules contrib dollar name. That's like a variable over there. Uh, but if it's uh, Drupal 7, the entry would probably be web slash site slash all slash modules slash contrib slash dollar name. So there is actually a Drupal 7 template as well, which I didn't mention uh, earlier. So, so it will exclude whatever should be excluded? I'm sorry? It will exclude what should be excluded? Uh, that's your git ignore file. Uh, I mean, nothing stops you from committing all these files, actually. Okay. It's just a best practice not to commit it. And you would add this in your git ignore, again, which is present in the Drupal Composer template. Okay, thank you. Hi there. Hey. Can you go back to that merge? That merge module you're showing. This so, one? So okay. yeah, that one here. So you have you said you have to do this to make the auto loader work properly, right? Otherwise you've got multiple auto loaders, that's the problem, right? With the with contributed modules. You, there this. can't be multiple auto loaders, so what's the purpose of this merge? So include? if you're writing a, so uh, two things. Let me let me clarify this further. If this was actually a contrib module, yeah. Uh, and the composer or JSON was present, uh, this was, let's say, committed to drupal.org. Yeah. Uh, now, in that case, packages.drupal.org will take care of this. You know, you don't need to do this in that case. So if you're using any contrib module, you don't have to worry about this. Oh, okay. This is only for your custom modules. In this case, uh, th this is a project, I, just like short background over here, this is a project I wrote for my organization to track all the contributions we make a as a whole team. Uh, so this website actually runs every 20 minutes, uh, queries Drupal.org and gets all the uh, contributions, like all comments, patches, and all that we have uploaded. So we are, we are querying Drupal.org API. And I didn't want to do that in this module, uh, mainly because I, w I had already written this uh, library for another project earlier. So this library was available to me. I didn't need to write all the logic. My custom module just had a composer or JSON which used that library. Uh, the problem here is when I, when I can put my custom uh, module over there, but of course the, that library won't get picked up. The API client, d.o API client won't get picked up because uh, when you run composer install in the root, it does not scan each and every composer or JSON in the path uh, by design. There's no way it can do that. So this plugin, this definition says that, okay, you're reading this uh, composer or JSON, but also read this one and get the libraries from there. And it'll kind of merge it. Uh, it'll merge it so that it, it appears it's a part of this composer or JSON itself, I mean internally, and all the libraries are placed uh, appropriately. So like in, in this case, the library would go to vendor directory. I, I hope, does so that it's answer? Pretty, it's pretty rare that you would have to do this, I guess, is what you're saying. I, I don't know. I, this was like a, this is the only custom module in this website, yeah. and I had to do this. So it, it's really a new use case. Okay, uh, I'm sorry, can we take, or uh, I think the next, do we take one more? All right, I think this this has yeah. to be the last one. Yeah, sure, so like I have a couple of questions. So like, uh, so like is, is it installing the module or is it just downloading the module? It's just downloading the module. Okay, and when it's installing the module, does it run the updates on that module also? Like for example, like uh, when I run the uh, composer again, Mm -hmm. Okay, and it will ins uh, get the latest module. So, yeah. will, will it run the updates? Uh, no, no, it won't. It like won't. I said, I think somebody asked this question. So, yeah, you have to run Rush DB again, mm -hmm. and that's something we are working on to to simplify. Okay, and the way like in the Drupal, we have the update manager module, right? That tells you, okay, there is a new patch is available yeah, for yeah. you. You know, do we have something for the composer? Like composer, like itself says, okay, there is a new up some updates for you. You need to download something. So yeah, there is a there is a command on Composer. It's slipping my mind right now, mm -hmm. which uh, checks for all the updates to all your packages. Mm -hmm. It just uh, tells them, okay, this is the version you have installed, and this is available, okay. as per your rules. And uh, like I forget the command. I'll, I'll 
post it later. Okay, so the, the Drupal update manager module going to be like uh, in align with the composer because like, like it still not is going really, to be the... Con not, not necessarily because uh, your composer, JSON could have version constraints. Mm -hmm. Update manager will always show the latest version. Mm -hmm. Okay. But the composer, you might have limited that, you know, I don't want anything after 1.5. Got it, got it. So <laughs> it won't show in that case. Okay. But Thank yeah, you. usually it will be aligned. I mean, unless you're using these kind of fancy version constraints, it will be aligned. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for attending. Thanks to you.